Uh, today I'm going to talk about spin-dependent recombination processes in phosphorus doped gamma irradiated silicon. Basically, this work has been done in collaboration with H. Marishita, one of our PhD students who has already graduated, and Professor Kohito, and uh, K. Swano, and Professor Y. Shiraki, uh, Shiraki from Tokyo City University, and Professor L. S. Velasenko from uh, AFOL uh, Physical Technical Institute, Institute in Russia. So today, uh, basically, I will talk. My talk will be on these two topics, which is one the electrically detected magnetic resonance and electrically detected cross relaxation. So, as you see, that both the topic includes the electrical method. So, in electrical method, what we do is that uh, we we try to monitor the conductivity of the sample under magnetic resonance conditions. So, the change in the conductivity can be because of this n which we call the carrier density or because of the change in the mobility. The mobility is affected because of spin dependent scattering and this phenomena is dominant only when we are talking at very high magnetic field and at very low temperature, uh, temperature which is like in dilution uh, refrigerators. But there is another uh, spin dependent phenomena which is called spin dependent recombination. So as you will see in my, in my uh, results that most of the work has been done in very low magnetic field that is nearly within um, less than 200 Gauss or so and in the temperature range of 5 Kelvin to 20 Kelvin. So, so basically in my results, it's, this is the do, uh, dominant factor. We neglect any spin dependent scattering part. So it is just the spin dependent recombination which is affecting. Now uh, one, I mean few advantages of this electrical method as compared to conventional ESR or so uh, methods for use for detecting paramagnetic centers is that that the signal intensity does not depend upon the magnetic field. So this allows you to work at very low magnetic field. So we can, at very low, I will talk about this, the usefulness of this low magnetic field later in my talk. And then these methods are very highly sensitive. Highly sensitive that you can probe very few a number of spins. And then you can also probe non detective centers using this uh, as compared to, I mean, the optical detection which has, uh, which uh, requires uh, the centers to be radiative. So, so this electrical method is used for detecting uh, paramagnetic centers in semiconductors, for example, phosphorus electron spins in silicon. So I'd just like to introduce uh, phosphorus in silicon. Basically, phosphorus has a, a nuclear spin, which is shown here, and a electron spin is hyperfine coupled to this nuclear spin. The uh, Hamiltonian describing this uh, phosphorus atom in a, in a silicon is given by this equation where the first term is the electron Zeeman term, the second term is the hyperfine interaction between the electron and the nuclear spins, and the third term is the nuclear Zeeman term. So the phosphorus and the electron uh, form these four eigenstates where I'm, uh, uh, the first here uh, represents the electron spin and the second represents the uh, nuclear spin. So you see uh, at, uh, in the high field regime, we have like four eigenstates here, and these are pure states, and uh, the transition marked by red, dark red, is called ESR allowed transitions. ESR allowed transitions means we have just a flip of electron. I mean, the nuclear spins are intact, and you just flip an electron. So from down spin to an uh, up spin. The electron goes from down spin to the up spin. So this is called ESR allowed transitions. Then we have NMR allowed, and this, there are some forbidden transitions which we don't generally see in high field regime. But now, we go to low magnetic field. In low magnetic field, because, for example, less than 200 Gauss or so, the, the second term here, the hyperfine interaction terms, dominates the whole Hamiltonian. That is a result of which we have, we don't have not pure states, but a superposition state, something like this. So because of superposition states, the forbidden transition here, which is marked by this uh, brown line here, the forbidden transition has some finite probability. But we cannot see this in ESR, using ESR. That's because ESR depends, I mean, the intensity in ESR depends upon the uh, magnetic field. So if you want to probe this, we have to go to very low magnetic field, and so the intensity will be very small, so you won't be able to see any signal. But the electrical method has this, significant, uh, this advantage that, that uh, the intensity does not depend upon the magnetic field, applied magnetic field. So we, were, uh, we can easily see this transition. 
And indeed, this has been done by uh, one of our uh, PhD students, uh, Marishita, who has uh, seen this, uh, this uh, forbidden transitions. And uh, according to him, and he has, uh, I mean, he has shown this EDMR, uh, I mean, this forbidden transition using low field EDMR signals. And uh, he explains his uh, result using donor acceptor recombination, where electron spin of phosphorus and the surface, uh, I mean, the PV center spins uh, have a spin dependent recombination channel. For example, I will just show his model here. So the way he explains is something like this. This is the model which uh, Morishita uh, has uh, used for explaining his result. And it's something like that. Under we illuminate our sample and creates a hole and an electron. Now we already have a phosphorus electron and a surface center electron, which we call PV center. Now this generally, when you illuminate, uh, I mean under steady state condition, what happens is that you are only left. I mean, if the phosphorus spin and the surface spins are in singlet state, that is, one is down and the other one is up, then if they are in singlet state, they will recombine very fast on a much faster time scale. But if they are in the triplet spin, then they don't recombine. As a result of which, under steady state condition, you will have only triplet pairs. Now, once you have a triplet pairs, what we do, we apply an RF field to resonate the spins. So we apply a resonance frequency like RF and start manipulating the spin. So once you start manipulating the spins, so you from triplet, you go to a singlet state. You manipulate this, you go to a singlet state. So a transition from phosphorus to the PV center takes place, something like this happens, and which eventually recombines with a hole. So we have given, I mean, the phosphorus is, level is empty, and uh, so it will, this phosphorus level traps an electron from a conduction band. So once this phosphorus level attracts an uh, electron from a conduction band, so conduction band is depleted of an electron. As a result of which, the conductivity in the, in the conduction band changes, which is monitored as an EDMR signal. So this was the model conduct, uh, used by Hiroki, where just the spin-dependent recombination between phosphorus and PV centers, which is at the surface, uh, takes place. And uh, here I just show you uh, EDMR signals using uh, uh, the, uh, with phosphorus concentration is like 10 to the power 15 per centimeter cube. Uh, we see these two lines are from phosphorus, and this is from PV center uh, to two different magnet, uh, two different resonance frequency. Now, what we do is to confirm this whether it is just the surface which is contributing to the EDMR signal. What we do is that we HF we use HF to to remove the surface oxide. And then we uh, do the measurement. That is just the black curve here represents the EDMR signal before HF treatment, and the red one represents after HF treatment. So you see that after HF, the intensity of all the uh, lines, I mean, the phosphorus, this represents the phosphorus, and here it is, we have the PV center. So the, all the three lines, the intensity goes down. This shows that once we do HF, we remove the PV center. So we have total number of spin pairs phosphorus and PB, which are uh, contributing to the, to the EDMR signal, goes down. So what we were probing now was only surf, I mean donor electrons only which is very near to the surface. Because if, I mean the bulk donors are very far from the, uh, from the PB centers, so the, so the distance is very large, so the recombination time will be very, very long. So only those P, uh, ph phosphorus atoms which are located nearly four nanometer from the surface contributes to the ADMR signals. So until now, only surface electron, uh, phosphorus electrons has been has been probed using ADMR signal. But what what about uh, the bulk? So to see bulk phosphorus using ADMR signal, which generally in ESR so we do, what I, what I have done is that I created paramagnetic centers in the bulk of the silicon. Rec uh, these are called recombination centers, and this is done by gamma ray irradiation. We irradiate our sample with gamma rays, and these are uh, high energy uh, particles which uh, uh, hits the sample, and you see, I mean, the, this four silicon, the, uh, the bonding between this four silicon is broken, and this two silicon bridge by trapping our oxygen, interstitial oxygen, and these two are having a vacancy here. A vacancy means a lone pair of electrons. Now, this lone pair of electrons could be in a singlet state like this, but uh, it can trap an oxygen. Uh, it can trap an electron from the conduction band and could be in a negative charge state, which we call as a center. But today I will just focus on the excited triplet state 
of this uh, oxygen vacancy complex, which we call as SL1 center. Because this is under illumination, we have this centers, SL1 centers. So what we, uh, just I show here the schematic of the formation of this SL1 centers. You see, uh, we start with a ground singlet state, which are the lone pair of electrons for these two silicons from ground singlet state and under illumination, we create a hole and an electron and uh, they trap an uh, electron and a hole from, uh, from the conduction and the valence band and get excited to the triplet level, something like this. And under magnetic field, we have a splitted level T plus T0 and T minus. And this T plus T0 and T minus, these are basically metastable states. So what happens is that they recombine back to the ground singlet state via spin orbit coupling, which is the recombination probability of these transitions to the ground singlet state is given by uh, spin orbit coupling. So, so it, it, it's, it's something uh, that it, it, uh, it recombines by the, uh, back to the singlet state. And again, this process continues. So under a steady state, we have uh, a triplet uh, population in, the, in silicon. So now let me just show you the effect of this gamma radiations on our EDMR signals. So here, you see, we have, I'm showing here the EDMR signal for without irradiated sample. And this is from irradiated sample. So under irradiation, we have created this bulk defects. And you see the intensity has enhanced significantly. But uh, this enhancement is because of, of uh, irradiation defects. But we don't exactly know whether this contribution is just from the surface or uh, even from, or, or from the bulk. To test that, what we do is that we take our irradiated sample and do the same thing, HF treatment. So this is here without HF treatment, and this is after HF treatment result. So after HF treatment, the phosphorus lines does not, the intensity does not change, but the surface has decreased. This is in contrast to the previous result where and after HF, all the, uh, the phosphorus as well as the PB center lines goes down. But here we don't see any change in the phosphorus intensity, but only PB. So this shows that this phosphorus, which we are looking at, are not from the surface, but from the bulk. So this, uh, this, uh, so the, uh, this gives a way to probe bulk donor spins using EDMR signals. I mean, using EDMR uh, uh, method. Moreover, uh, as we can see that we have a significant enhancement, we can also see in 10 to the power 15 samples, we were not able to see earlier any forbidden transitions. But after gamma irradiations, we can see this, this marked arrow here is the forbidden transitions, we have phosphorus. So because of the enhanced efficiency of recombination, we are able to see uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, forbidden transition as well as some other, uh, other uh, peaks which were generally, again, because of low magnetic field from SL1 centers. So we, I have explained the effect of uh, uh, this uh, the bulk uh, parametric centers on ADMR signals. So now I just here show the full scan of the spectra. So what I did, I've applied RF frequency of 400 megahertz. And you see, uh, we see phosphorus lines. This two, this two, li these two lines are phosphorus. Then we have a surface center in the middle. And then there we have zero field line, which has zero magnetic field. Then this is a signal, which I will explain later. And then we have SL1 lines. So you see, this phosphorus and SL1 are in the bulk. So now what happens, we are having two spin system in our bulk, phosphorus and SL1. So two, type of, two types of paramagnetic centers in the bulk. And we can see some exciting things because of these two different <coughs> paramagnetic centers in the sample. So let's Im imagine that we have a lattice and two spin system in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the lattice. Now the, both the spin system will try to achieve Boltzmann distribution among their energy levels with respective T1 time, which we call a spin lattice relaxation time. But then they can also interact between each other, which is called spin-spin -spin interaction. Now what happens when they are interacting uh, with each other and you're trying to monitor the conductivity under scanning magnetic, uh, magnetic field? So that is, that is what I'm going to show in my uh, next slides. But then, the, uh, and this interaction between two magnetic field, uh, between two spin systems, you will see that when you, uh, when you scan the magnetic field, then at a particular point, you can have the Zeeman energies of the two spin systems match equally. And when they match, the electron spins of two spin systems flip-flops among themselves. This, this flip-flop of electron spins between the two paramagnetic 
species, it was termed as cross relaxation, which we, I mean, it's called cross relaxation between the spin system. Basically, this term was coined by Blombergen et al. in way back in 1959, and he gave this indirect relaxation process between the spin uh, between the spin system when the Zeeman energies are equal. So these two spin uh, the two spin systems are interacting due to the dipole-dipole interactions, and at those magnetic fields, specific points where you have the same Zeeman energies of the two system, then you have a spin flip-flop between the, between the uh, electron spins. Now, I will see what happens when we, for, for our system, for example, in our system, we have a phosphorus and SL1 center. So here I just show you the Zeeman energies of phosphorus, phosphorus and SL1 centers, basically SL10 and SL190. You can just see here, that SL10 and SL190 are two different orientations of uh, the defect, uh, oxygen vacancy defect in the sample. And these two are different orientations, means they have different magnetic field directions for this. Uh, and therefore, the Zeeman energies are, I mean, Zeeman splittings are different here. So, uh, in the next slide, I will just show this is the uh, change in the conductivity, photoconductivity. I mean, I will just try to explain it properly here, that what we do is that we turn off our resonance frequency, we don't apply any resonance frequency, and we just scan the magnetic field under illumination. So you see, you, we are scanning magnetic field under illumination, and we see a change in the conductivity, photoconductivity here, and these terms. And in the B part, I plot the energy differences. For example, delta E, zero SL1, is the energy difference here, Delta E as a 90 SL1 is the energy difference in this between these levels, and the three lines here represents the energy difference in the I mean the Zeeman energies in the phosphorus levels. You see, whenever the Zeeman energy crosses, we see a change in the photoconductivity at this point and these three points. So this this is what we call as a cross relaxation effect. Whenever the Zeeman energies happens, the, uh, the, uh, the spin flip-flops, and you see a change in the photoconductivity of the samples. Now, as we know that SL1 center is anisotropic because you know it depends upon the Zeeman energy splitting depends upon the magnetic field directions. So, to confirm that this uh, uh, this uh, signals are because of the cross relaxation effect, uh, we try to do the angular dependence because if is it is SL1 then uh, uh, it should be reflected in the angular dependence of this uh, cross relaxation signal. But just, just before going that, I just, just show you once more that we don't see any effect of resonance frequency on the cross relaxation lines. The green dotted lines marks the cross relaxation position and you see that for different resonance frequency, we don't see any shift of this line. So this more or less clearly uh, says that the, this uh, does not depend upon the resonance frequency. The uh, cross relaxation lines does not depend upon the resonance frequency. Now, as I said, that it should be reflected in the angular dependence. So, what we do is that we try to change the angle between the magnetic field and the sample, up, and we see a different. I mean, uh, angular dependence is something like this. But then uh, we were not able to perform complete angular dependence using our system because of the limitation in the uh, complete angular dependence from going to zero to 90 degree. So what we do is we use uh, X-band EPR system where we have a complete angular dependence is possible and we try to see the, uh, the signals uh, from zero to 90 degree and it has been plotted here. The various, uh, the dot represents uh, the and the experimental data points and the solid line, the curve represents uh, the calculated positions of the crossing between SL1 center and phosphorus Zeeman energies. So you see that the, the calculated position and the, and, the, and the dots matches exactly very well. So this confirms that what we are seeing is the, uh, as, uh, the cross relaxation between phosphorus and SL1 center. Now, uh, j just to give uh, uh, the model what it is like, like for example, we have a phosphorus uh, levels and we have SL1 levels. Now, if a phosphorus electron goes from an up spin to a down spin here, then and the energy re uh, released by this generally goes to the lattice or is again absorbed by the other electron from down to up. 
But under cross relaxation, what happens is that when a phosphorus goes from up spin to down spin, the energy is being absorbed by the SL1 center. So SL1 center goes from, for example, this zero level to from to plus one level here. So this this change in the in the in the population within the SL1 affects the whole recombination process uh, of the conduction electrons through the recombination centers. As a result of which we change see a see a change in the photoconductivity of the sample. However, to see the see this cross relaxation effect, this condition has to be met where what is I call as the cross relaxation rate has to be faster than the lifetime of the samples. I mean, the lifetime of the SL1 centers, and that's quite obvious that if we, uh, we want to have SL1 center to see this uh, cross relaxation rate, and which in turn must be higher than the uh, than the relaxation rate. Generally, the lifetime of the centers, SL1 centers, are of the order of milliseconds. So it was calculated that phosphorus and SL1 centers, which are I mean, which are having a separation of nearly 20 nanometer or so, have a cross relaxation time of the order of of milliseconds because we want cross relaxation times to be of the order of millisecond or less. So, uh, so generally, uh, it is only for the separation 20 nanometer or less uh, between phosphorus and SL1, which contributes to the cross relaxation signals. So we see nearly. Uh, taking into account the concentration of SL1 and phosphorus in our sample, we see nearly 10 to the power 8 spin pairs of phosphorus and SL1, which are distributed in this range, I mean, where the separation are less than equals to 20 nanometer. So uh, this, this, this explains, I mean, uh, so you see the electrical detection of cross relaxation is a very simple uh, method for detecting a parameter centers. It's just you have to uh, scan the magnetic field without application of any resonance frequency. And highly sensitive because you are uh, spin, uh, seeing 10 to the power 8 spin or even less uh, for this, and uh, we can uh, we can uh, detect both radiative and non-radiative centers uh, using this cross relaxation. I mean, electrical detection of cross relaxation method. So I'd like to conclude here that uh, with the uh, we see a significant enhancement in our sample. I mean, in the EDMR signal under uh, gamma radiations. And then possibility of probing bulk phosphorus atom using EDMR. So this was something which is exciting to some extent that we can probe bulk phosphorus atom as compared to the surface phosphorus. And then I just gave a new method for detecting paramagnetic centers, which we call as electrical detection of cross relaxation. And this signals arise due to flip-flop transitions between phosphorus and SL1 center. Thank you very much for your connection.